There's a true story that most of this world would find absolutely incredible. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Those words of Acts 15, 40 and 41 are only one of several records of the work of the apostles of Jesus who planted churches, then revisited those Christians to support and increase their growing faith. The word translated confirming means establishing besides, strengthening more, rendering more firm. The record continues in Acts 16.4 to show what they did and what resulted. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. This Confirming the Church's Bible class focuses on those decrees of the Apostles that will help us to grow stronger in faith and service if we learn and apply them. How did this world start? Why is it here? What lies in our future? You know, if we search through all the writings and teachings of men, we'll find numerous kinds of answers, I suppose, but most of them will dwell on the idea that it just happened. It just one day began in some kind of a way. Some talk about a giant explosion, others just talk about it happening. Some would even say that it's always been here. There never was a time when it didn't exist. But if we read everything that's available in the world, gather all of the evidence, we're going to come across a book that begins with these words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And that's going to sound incredible to many people, but the honest person will read through the rest of that book to try to find out whether or not there's any truth to it. Is it a believable story? Let's examine at least the basic thought, the basic principle, the summary, if you will, of uh, this book, which we call the Bible, which God called the Bible in Revelation chapter 20. In that first chapter of Genesis, after the Bible begins by saying, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, it goes on to tell us how he began by creating first light and then the atmosphere around the earth, and he separated the water from the land and uh, <clears throat> caused the dry land to appear, and all the things that are created, the plants and the animals, and finally how he created man himself. In chapter 2 of Genesis, he goes further into detail about how he created man and then how he created woman to make man complete. God created it. Well, that's a statement. We don't stand on that and expect you to believe it just because we say it or just because it's written here. The Bible is a very lengthy library of 66 books, and we'll have to read all of the evidence to get all of the information so that we can make a, uh, an intelligent decision uh, upon these things. God created man, so we're told, and then the record tells us what man did. In Genesis chapter 2, in verses 15 through 17, we read that God created a garden. He put the man in the garden, said you can eat from every tree in the garden except that one tree in the midst of the garden. From that tree, don't eat. God gave them a command and an instruction. But when we come over to chapter 3 and verse 6, we read, The woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was uh, desired to make one wise. She ate of the fruit, and then she gave to her husband, and he ate of the fruit. They violated the instructions of God. They broke the law. That's what happened in the beginning. God created everything and said, Behold, it was very good. He created it all right. But he gave man the choice. He says, you can eat from this tree or that tree as you like, but don't eat from that one over there. So man had the choice. Man had options. And he chose to violate the specific instruction about eating on from that one particular tree. Well, what did God do about that? In chapter 3 of Genesis, as we begin in verse 16, God said to the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in childbearing. To the man, he said, because you've hearkened to the voice of your wife and you've eaten from that tree of which I told you 
not to eat, then he said the earth is going to be a, a difficult task for you to, to uh, raise your crops. It's not going to grow up for you anymore like it did in the perfect garden. You're going to have to plant and till and sow and, and uh, reap, and it's going to be difficult. The earth is going to bring forth thistles and thorns, and um, you're going to have to work by the sweat of your face in order to get uh, your uh, food from now on. And then God cast them both out of the garden. And he put an angel in the way to guard the way of the tree of life so man could not eat from that tree and live forever. Death came into the world because of man's choice simply to ignore or to disrespect and to violate God's word. God, the all-powerful eternal creator, created this world, made it a perfect place for man, put man here, and then man broke God's law, separated himself from God. Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2 tells us that sin has separated between us and God so that he will not hear and he will not save. He's capable of doing so, he's willing to do so, but he doesn't because of our sin. But God made a promise. In chapter 3 in verse 15 of Genesis, he of Genesis, as we begin in verse 16, God said to the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in childbearing. To the man, he said, because you've hearkened to the voice of your wife and you've eaten from that tree of which I told you not to eat, then he said, the earth is going to be a, a difficult task for you to, to uh, raise your crops. It's not going to grow up for you anymore like it did in the perfect garden. You're going to have to plant and till and sow and and uh, reap and it's going to be difficult the earth is going to bring forth thistles and thorns and um, you're going to have to work by the sweat of your face in order to get uh, your uh, food from now on and then god cast them both out of the garden and he put an angel in the way to guard the way of the tree of life so man could not eat from that tree and live forever death came into the world because of man's choice simply to ignore or to disrespect and to violate God's Word. God, the all-powerful eternal Creator, created this world, made it a perfect place for man, put man here, and then man broke God's law, separated himself from God. Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2 tells us that sin has separated between us and God so that he will not hear and he will not save. He's capable of doing so, he's willing to do so, but he doesn't because of our sin. But God made a promise. In chapter 3 in verse 15 of Genesis, God said that uh, someone is coming who's going to destroy the power of the Satan, uh, 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 the power... In verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3, uh, God says, Someone is coming who's going to destroy the power of Satan. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, he said to Satan, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Satan was going to hurt man, but this one man who's coming is going to uh, completely crush the power of Satan. And so we have the rest of the... Bible before us to see how that situation and that promise develop. We go on through the first 39 books of the Bible, the Old Testament. Uh, God uses those terms, Old Testament, Old Covenant, New, and New Testament, New Covenant, in uh, Hebrews chapter 7, 8, and 9. So these aren't man-made designations. God gave a, a set of books, and then he waited a while, and then he gave another set of books we call the New Testament. And throughout that Old Testament period, he sent um, many uh, judges, prophets, priests, kings, and the prophets and the priests generally pointed the people back to the law and said, obey what was written long ago. In chapter 31 of the prophecy of Jeremiah, verses 31 to 34, God said, somebody's coming who's going to fulfill all of this, who's going to give us a perfect life, and everybody will know who God is, everybody who's in his kingdom. 
we'll know who God is and we'll be his faithful servants. Well, God verified his authority to punish man in that regard. God verified uh, his promise in numerous ways and um, showed man by miraculous events uh, that he meant what he said and he was capable and he was uh, intending to do and he would do exactly what he promised. Uh, for example, uh, later in history, in the 50th chapter of Genesis, we uh, come to, uh, well, the end of the book of Genesis and summarizing the life of a man named Joseph. Joseph was a young boy, teenager probably, had 10 older brothers who resented him for various reasons and they sold him as a slave into Egypt. Seemed like a pretty bad deal, right? But in Egypt, God protected him at least twice uh, in two different uh, locations and then raised him up to be second in command over all of Egypt after Pharaoh only himself. And later when his brothers came to him and they were reunited, uh, they were afraid that Joseph was going to take retribution against them. But he said, as it's recorded in Genesis 50 in verse number 20, as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring it to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. God had protected his people from a great famine and gave them a place to live in the fruitful area of Egypt. Uh, God uh, was protecting his people. God was effecting uh, his plan. He was uh, verifying his promise that he had given as far back as to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. During the um, following generation, when Egyptians had turned against uh, Joseph and his family, Abraham's family, God rescued them from Egypt uh, by defeating Egypt through a series of ten plagues Exodus chapters 7 through 12 or record all of these uh, plagues of uh, water turning to blood, frogs, lice, flies, uh, diseases in cattle, boils, hail, locust, uh, intense darkness, and finally the death of the firstborn in every family. These things were done to get the attention and to get the um, uh, agreement of, of Pharaoh uh, to release God's people. In the wilderness, God led his people visibly by a pillar of cloud at, in the daytime and a pillar of fire by night, Exodus chapter 13. He uh, divided the Red Sea to uh, help uh, the people uh, find a way of escape out of Egypt, uh, opened the water so they went through on dry ground, and then when Pharaoh's armies tried to pursue after the water crashed down and uh, destroyed the armies and protected, again, God's people in order to protect his promise that he had made. Finally, he gave them the law at Mount Sinai through which they were governed for uh, the ensuing uh, millennia and a half. Uh, the law given through Moses that lasted all the way up until the time of Jesus, uh, the prophets that lived through that period of time had uh, prophesied of a coming Savior. And the word Jesus means Savior. When he was born, he was given that name. But not just to, to manufacture an apparent fulfillment, because uh, the prophets had for hundreds of years told details of his life, where he would be born, to whom, under what circumstances, uh, where he would live, how he would teach, and the miracles that he would do. These and many more were prophesied and recorded in the New Testament as fulfilled in the life of Jesus. Beginning in Luke chapter 2, we read of his, uh, his birth exactly according to the prophecies. Born of a virgin in the village of Bethlehem. He had uh, 30 years approximately to live with his family and to uh, grow up into mature manhood. Then he uh, came into the public uh, acknowledgement or public uh, awareness and began to do his teaching. And his teaching was of a higher moral standard than the people were accustomed to. Uh, at one occasion in um, Matthew chapter 7, 
Uh, it says that the people uh, were astonished at his teaching because he taught them with authority, not like their scribes did. And his authoritative teaching was verified by God through many miracles. Jesus on one occasion took a young boy's lunch and multiplied it many fold to feed over 5,000 people. And on another occasion after that, a uh, similar thing to feed over 4,000 more people. He was seen after that occasion to be walking on the water as he came to his disciples by night, uh, amazed them with uh, something that, of course, people can't do, but Jesus did. And then they crucified him because they didn't care for his moral teaching and his popularity. His leaders were jealous of his popularity. So they crucified him. But Peter would later say that too was according to God's eternal purpose. That was the plan. He came into this world to sacrifice his life as payment that uh, was actually ours due to God because of our sin. But after he was crucified, he rose from the dead. Matthew chapter 24 and the first seven verses describe uh, people coming to the temple and, and met by an angel. You look for Jesus. He isn't here. He is risen. And he appeared to many people, uh, verif uh, verifying that he was in fact alive again after he was known to be dead. And then the um, Gospel of John comes near its conclusion having written of these teachings and miracles of Jesus, and says in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, the, uh, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. All of the Bible points to Jesus, his birth, his life, his teaching, his miracles, his death, his resurrection, his ascension back to heaven, and the teaching of his disciples that would follow after that. Jesus, it's recorded in John 5 and verse 39, said, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And he was talking then about the Old Testament. It's the only scripture that had been written at that point. All of the Bible is about Jesus. He is the one that God appointed to be the Savior of man's souls. Savior needed because of our sin against him. We aren't sinners because Adam sinned, but because we all sin. In, in the book of Genesis, in the um, case of the flood and Noah building his ark, the scripture says that man's heart is evil from his youth. In Romans chapter 3, in verse 23, Paul wrote, But uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have sinned. We weren't born in sin, but sometime in our youth we began to develop evil hearts. And that word evil is used in the Bible simply to describe a rejection of God. Just as Adam and Eve did when they rejected God's instructions, don't eat from that tree. Eventually, all of us, if we have normal intelligence, normal mental faculties, will choose for ourselves and go against what God wills in our life. And we are in sin and in need of a Savior. But in Jesus, God has promised us not only forgiveness for our sin, but a, an escape, a release from this world in which we are always tempted to sin. In John chapter 14, and in the first three verses, uh, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will surely come and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. God has promised an eternal home in heaven, a place where there is no temptation, no evil all around us. Uh, no weakness of the flesh that causes us to fail from time to time. In Revelation, in the last book of the Bible, in the last chapter but one, in chapter number 21, and in the first uh, 
Well, in the fourth verse, in chapter 21 and verse 4 of Revelation, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That's the promise of God for us today. In, uh, chapter, in, in the same chapter, and in verse number 10, he continues, uh, John, uh, Jesus was giving John, who wrote the book of Revelation, a vision of the future. And he says, He carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me that great city, holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And he describes that in verses 18 and following. Uh, the building of the wall of it was like uh, was of jasper, and the city was of, was pure gold like unto glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the first chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth the sardius, the seventh a chrysolite, the eighth a beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, and the eleventh a jacinth. And the, and the twelfth was an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. A place of beauty beyond man's imagination. And the Bible says that God has prepared for us something which we cannot even imagine in the flesh, because it's beyond this fleshly realm something that is perfect, that is high, that is far above anything that we can create or anything that God has given us here on earth. He continues down in the 24th verse, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. The kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory of the, and honor of the nations into it, and there shall be, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. God has prepared a place for us to live in perfection, as we were designed to live, when He created the earth in the first place. Behold, it was very good. But we let sin come into the world, and sin besets us every day. So what are we to do about it? Jesus has paid the price. God has laid out the plan. God has made the promises. But what? how do we take advantage of those promises? In John chapter 8 and verse 34, Jesus said, If you believe not that I am he, except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. We need to be, uh, begin by believing that Jesus is the Christ, just as we read a while ago in John chapter 20, uh, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that believing you might have life in his name, not by believing only. That's not the only thing the Bible says. Yes, it says uh, believing you might have life in his name, but it says other things as well. We need to put them all together. In Luke 13 and verse 3, Jesus said, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. We need to have the will to turn away from sin. Not just believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but believe it sufficiently that we're willing to follow His, His walk in life, His instructions in life, and His command to stop sinning, to stop living without God, and start living according to the Word of God. And then we, want, it, it, we still haven't, haven't got there yet. In Romans chapter 10, uh, confession is made unto salvation. Well, we're on our way, we're up to it, but we're not in salvation when we have confessed Christ, when we have believed in Christ, when we have repented from Christ. There needs to be that confession of Christ. Uh, God commands us to be buried with Jesus because in his death, Jesus put the old life to death and he rose to a new life. Our old life is filled with sin and we need to put that to death. And God has described that beautifully in numerous passages, both in the Old Testament and in the New. It didn't command it under the Old, but described it, anticipated its coming. And then told us in this New Testament, uh, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 15 and 16. When the people heard Peter first preach the gospel in Acts chapter 2, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And then in Romans 
uh, chapter uh, 6, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, What well, know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The new life that God promises to us begins when we come up from our baptism. We're buried in the likeness of his death and we're raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Put the old man of sin to death, Paul goes on to say there in Romans chapter 6, and begin to walk in a new life. God has created this world with a purpose. The purpose being to bless you, to bless me, to bless every soul who will ever have lived. God is not willing that any should perish, but many will. What did Jesus say? Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Many will perish. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And when we have repented from sin, we stop the will to sin and work hard at stopping the practice of sin, confess our faith in Jesus and are baptized into him, we rise to walk in newness of life in which God will forever bless us. Vainly we seek after men for guiding light Or in dreams for a heavenly call Man of himself cannot set his soul aright So it's back to the Bible for it all Back to the Bible, the God-given Bible, for grace and duty, great or small. Each one may know what to do and where we go, but it's back to the Bible for it all.